strategy, which is how complementary are the business models. So if these are not there, recipe for disaster. So if you look at uh, the complexity and the degree of involvement from a simple vendor contract to a very complex mergers and acquisition, the level and degree of involvement depends on what type of a deal you are doing with uh, an Indian company or vice versa. So this has to be kept in mind when you are looking at uh, mergers and alliances. So if you look at the different cultures uh, of an MNC and an emerging MNC, mostly global pharma have many projects to work on. So they said, okay, where is the best buck for the money? So they could only focus on a few. As Indian companies or emerging companies work at many projects, uh, work at less number of projects, and sometimes they also look at not so great opportunities. Global pharma are very data focused. Indian companies not so intense about data validation. Global pharma is a five day week. Uh, once I remember the, our commerce minister saying that in France there is a 35 hour week, whereas in India you have a 35 hour day. So this normally happens in most Indian companies. Saturday, Sunday, the boss is called, you got to work. So this is a very different culture. Uh, MNCs have access to latest equipment and knowledge. Uh, emerging market um, MNCs are a little more uh, strapped on that. And the project responsibility in a global pharma company is distributed among many, whereas it is not the case in uh, an emerging uh, pharma MNC. So when you look at the value being created, it is actually uh, what you call as our uh, pav bhaji as we eat every day. It must have culture, it must have synergy, it must have control. The right mix will give you the right pav bhaji. So the value is from, from this. This is something that people fail to understand. It, you can't just focus on control. It has to be culture, control, synergy. And I work for a Japanese company and you know Japanese are very, very slow in terms of making a decision. But once taken, it is uh, 200 kilometers per hour. But till you come to that level, it is maybe 0 to 10 kilometers per hour. So if an Indian company does not understand that, it's going to be a problem. So what do the MNCs bring? New product, new technology, investment. Uh, they have global market knowledge. They bring in quality systems. Uh, they bring in their leadership team. Whereas what works for Indian companies is fantastic market knowledge, entrepreneurial, uh, they have a huge pool of treatment knife uh, population, the economy is growing, fantastic chemistry skills, low cost advantage and an enormous field force. 7,000 is the field force of Piramal. Ranbaxi also 6,000. Most MNCs would be maxed around 1,500, 2,000. So you, if you really want more feet on the ground, you have no choice but to go to an Indian company and that's what people are doing. So therefore, there are benefits of collaboration for uh, both the Indian company and the MNC, wider portfolio of drugs for Indian company, better treatment options, a rep can make his uh, call more profitable, higher share of voice, uh, of course improved quality of drugs and treatment. So there are benefits of collaboration and benefits of alliances. But what really spoils the game is uh, how you do the deal. Uh, there are really big challenges and, and I go uh, uh, and I face it every day. When I deal with uh, one Indian company and I deal with an MNC, so there are lots of issues which I have. A lot of my hair has gone off because of that only. It requires a lot of daily watering of the plant. Because the market is complex, there's issues on pricing, uh, there's issues on patents, which really is now the buzzword. There are issues on uh, technology. Uh, quality of documentation. Japanese want in this way, whereas DCGA wants in this way, or Unique says I can only give in this way. So there are so many issues which happen. But at the end of the day, one who is able to manage it all well and stay calm in the chaos, he is the one who wins. So there are really challenges in uh, managing alliances in emerging markets. And if you look at uh, working with uh, emerging uh, uh, MNCs, you have issues with data issues with the bioequivalent study. So what we have done now, early on we engage with them, early on. 
much, much early, so you don't get surprises later on. We have issues of API supply. So rules of the game are explained much, much early to mitigate this. So also we need to make sure that we have alternate uh, vendor supplies. Product quality is also from sometimes I find from batch to batch keeps changing. How do you manage that? Regular check is needed. Intellectual property is a big problem. You find uh, uh, compulsory licensing being given for a reason which we never knew. So there are lots of issues. So when you work with EMS, you have to come with your eyes wide open. You can't say it's a walk in the park. There are challenges, but if you really meet them, there's going to be success. So some of the challenges in emerging market, the m and uh, we know about valuation, everyone wants big bucks after the Renbaxi and Piramal uh, uh, deal. There are issues of uh, targets. There is also now competition from uh, the uh, private equity guys. So there are also barriers to successful M&A uh, strategy. Why do alliances fail? Most of the time it is about culture. There are numerous examples I can quote about egos coming the way because someone feels that this is not the way it is done in India and someone doesn't feel this is really a norm in, uh, in, other, in other countries. So there are issues of uh, poor alliance management, issues of um, failure in technology, maybe the market potential is uh, uh, really overestimated. So some of the imperatives are we must have a well-defined uh, reward risk structure, absolute planning and implementation and communication is the key. Flexibility, Indian market is very changing. You need to be flexible, resources have to be committed upfront and more important, we need to respect the organization behaviors and of course the culture. So, uh, some of the key considerations, you need to really make sure you have the right uh, partner, you have the optimal number of partners, you have really good relationship management, good negotiation in terms of the contracts and project management. Some of the best practices, I don't want to go through uh, everything, but the key thing is we need to involve, which I've seen very, very crucial is involve the alliance manager upfront. The deal happened between two company headquarters and the country manager is not involved. And that's where problems start to come. Early on, we must involve the alliance manager. And more important, if you strike the deal terms in a proper way, it helps because once the ink has dried, nothing much can be done. So some of the best practices really is all about uh, communicating, making the expectation clear early on, and constant communication is, is the key. So in conclusion, alliances and partnerships are crucial for Indian pharmaceutical market. Uh, we have three, we might have six going forward. Cultural, strategic and operational fit is the key. Most important expectations and the strategic objective have to be understood early on and a lot of hard work in project management would ensure that the alliances work. Once again, thank you very much for your uh, patience and uh, have a nice evening. Uh, thanks, Shogumar, and I request Satya Brahma to give the memento. And as he said, every partnership should lead to the synergism, a win win situation. And I think that is the key as far as the alliances and partnership is considered. speaker and today we are talking very high about supply chain management which is the service to manage the inventory and which ultimately increasing the profitability and reliability in the minds of customers. We invite overseas expert personality on this topic delivering the value in the supply chain. We invite Sue Arden, VP Life Sciences and Healthcare Singapore.
body. Okay, I'm not quite sure how to operate this, we'll give it a go. Um, thank you, thank you to the organisers for allowing us to uh, participate in, uh, in this prestigious event. Um, DHL is uh, an organisation that um, I personally worked for for some 13 years. Um, we've certainly got some large collaborations with um, a lot of the pharma guys, both MNC and uh, Big Pharma, and also a lot of the Indian companies. So the presentation that I have today is really about where we think we can add some value. Um, I think by maybe sharing some of the insights that we have in other markets, there might be um, some interest in doing some, um, some additional things with you in India. So, okay. Uh, firstly, who is DHL? Um, I think most of you would know that we're um, a, a global organisation with quite a large footprint. Um, we have many different areas of the business, but the customer promise that we have is to actually be simple to do business with. So it's about producing an environment where we can engage customers easily. So it's about producing solutions that are sustainable, but more importantly, that the engagement is easy. From a healthcare perspective, we have um, various sectors within the organisation. Um, healthcare is a global sector. We have a, a sponsor at board level. What this basically means is that we have an opportunity to take the message in terms of solution development or investment to a very high level within the organisation very quickly. So in terms of healthcare, the aspiration is actually to be the um, logistics partner for healthcare for the environment globally. We have a global infrastructure. We have a network that actually is positioned in a lot of the developing and also mature markets. So in terms of you and your product, it should have an infrastructure to allow you to get your product to market. Reliability and quality, we've heard from uh, many of the presenters this evening that quality and reliability is key to your product. We understand that. We think that we've got the people that have actually been trained we, we've listened to the customer, so we think that we've got something in terms of a logistics product that can actually provide value to your product. In terms of innovation, I mentioned before simplicity of solution. It's about being easy to work with. It's about taking complexity out of the market. With the collaboration, and I'll expand on that in a moment, um, we like to think that we have the voice of the customer, so we're actually creating something that is really what you need for your product. I mentioned before that we had uh, trained personnel. We work with uh, many different environments, emerging markets, mature markets, regulatory group, etc., etc. But in terms of community, we have a very large community within DHL. So they're logisticians that understand healthcare. It's not an IT box, it's a box that has medicine that needs to get to market in a reasonable condition. It has a time factor involved, etc. So globally, we have over 4,000 people that actually understand your product. So I mentioned before voice of customer. Um, globally, we've created a platform. We have um, global events once a year. They're hosted in each of the regions. Um, last year, we had um, uh, Shanghai, so Asia had an opportunity to host the event. Um, next year, we'll actually be in, uh, in the US. So basically, the event will move from Europe to Asia to the Americas. And what we do is we invite customers to participate. We invite customers to actually share best practice we hold workshops. In those environments, we share some of the solution development, but also importantly, get your feedback. So voice of customer to us, we create the platform. This is um, feedback from the last event that we had. And, and basically, I'm hearing a lot of common um, trends here in India in this environment in terms of some of the areas that people have focused on. So key takeaways from the last event for us, if we look at the top five, really look at the cost, the efficiency of the market, focus on emerging markets. A lot of the um, big farmers, irrespective of the region that we look at, are still focused on developing markets. India, I've heard, is actually a market that has developed. I think that's possibly true, but there's also a lot that we can do in this market as well. Regulatory compliance, to help us understand that from a logistics standpoint, we actually have over 70 uh, pharmaceutical uh, people that focus purely on Q&A. They help us with our training, they help us with the DNA that we can um, actually instill in our people. And then of course, direct to market. The focus that has been coming from the event in the last couple of years is telling us that people in the um, pharma world are looking for something that gets product to market faster, more efficiently, make sure that you can actually sell your products to the people that need them.
we also create platforms locally. So whether we're talking country, whether we're talking globally, we also host events where we again invite um, people from the pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing area to help us understand the market. This was a study that um, DHL supported with OPPI. This is some of the feedback and again some of the learnings. We hear a lot of comparison about uh, India and China. Uh, there really isn't a lot of comparison in my view. Um, both markets are very, very different. India certainly in terms of export um, is very, very global where China is still looking more at our domestic market, but this just gives a snapshot of the differences in those markets. That's why I'm sharing it. So, direct to market, um, I mentioned, was one of the areas that was coming up. Um, basically, this is um, a, a case study that I wanted to share with you. We talked about how we bring value to market, and I think one of the things that we found in, um, in a couple of the um, countries, both mature and um, emerging markets, is that um, you have to be able to do things differently. You have to be innovative about the way that the product is getting to market. You have to look at what the regulatory compliances are, etc., etc. In this particular case, there was an opportunity with a manufacturer and they were looking at ways that they could improve their supply chain. They had various uh, acquisitions, so they had a lot of duplication. They had a lot of inventory sitting in locations where they couldn't see it, so the visibility was uh, very low. And they also had um, areas in cash flow that they wanted to improve. So there was a project, uh, we participated in that. Um, we actually enlisted a lot of the um, support from our um, uh, in-house consulting team, and we applied for the project. We were successful in that, uh, in that application. We certainly made um, some recommendations to create the transformation to the way that the product was getting through to market. I'm very pleased to say that we were able to achieve some very significant um, cost saving for the customer. Uh, we not only increased the visibility in terms of where the inventory was, we also created some rationalisation in terms of CFAs, why would you have three in one state, etc, etc. Um, the customer has been able to seek value or seek um, significant cost improvement to the tune of uh, 10%. Um, so what we're seeing is again, as, as we have more mass going through this particular solution, that we can actually improve even further. So one of the key takeaways and one of the areas and I think an organisation like DHL can help is in actually bringing best practice to a market like India. We have a lot of solutions, we have a lot of um, different healthcare specialists out there. There's a, an awful lot of different services that we have. Uh, we run a very large operation in the UK for the National um, Health uh, NHS there. So again, that's more of a procurement based service, but what it talks about is changing the market. We have an awful lot um, to offer in terms of footprint. And again, from a value perspective, we look at markets where we have best practice, have a look to see whether or not that can actually be something that can be shared with the environment that we're working in, and then bring the investment to play to help that come um, to fruition. So in this particular case, there was many areas uh, in terms of the customer experience that we implemented. Um, the customer segmentation was quite interesting because what we actually did was we created value for the manufacturer in actually understanding his customer, how his customer's um, buying um, habits were, but, but also to the amount of product that came through. So you could actually treat customer that was putting a lot of volume through your business a little bit differently to somebody that maybe wasn't um, spending as much with you, but possibly with somebody else. Um, so the service levels and things like that were actually very positive from the end user, very positive from a CFA perspective, but also more importantly, uh, very positive from a manufacturer standpoint because product was getting to market. We could also capture the areas where possibly stock was not available. We could understand um, you know, the peaks at the end of the month um, and actually help manage some of those as well. Um, I think in terms of the network, uh, there were also other areas that we could look at. Obviously, um, you know, there has to be a return on investment from uh, any organisation. Um, India represents an awful lot of opportunity to an organisation like ourselves, but we're also prepared to put investment into that. So in terms of network, uh, we've also created a transportation area that can help with pharmaceutical product getting to an user as well. So a key takeaway from here is that there is value in bringing best practice, there is value in looking at large organisations that possibly have some operations um, somewhere else, another geography that can be um, brought into the market, localised 
and then add value to you as well. I mentioned investment. Um, to this point, uh, the organisation has invested over 200 million euro just in the infrastructure in India. Um, you saw the first slide where there were very, uh, or quite a few different pillars of the organisation. This slide really just is a takeaway of different things that we've created to market. We've, we were the first organisation in India to actually build a free trade zone. Um, what that actually allowed us to do was to offer manufacturers, whether we're talking import or export, the value of bringing product into a zone where you weren't paying any duties or taxes. You could actually house it in an environment that had cold chain, if that's what you required. And um, then the product could be used you know, in the environment that you needed or the quantity that you needed. So again, first to market with that. Pan-European transport, an investment that really came from the initial case study with direct to market. We saw that there was a gap we saw that there was something that had to happen. So again, key takeaway here is that we have deep pockets, we are a large organisation, we've invested a lot and we're also committed to invest a lot more in India. Um, it's future for us as well, so I'd encourage you to um, ask us to push the boundaries. Domestically, um, most of you would know Blue Dart, the organisation that, um, that we acquired some time ago. They've invested um, a lot of money in a cold uh, temperature control packaging and dry ice um, so that you can get product through to market even in a domestic environment um, in the condition that it's supposed to be in. So again, a lot of different things that we're investing in to help you get your product to market a little bit quicker and certainly in the right condition. Just a snapshot of who we are in India, uh, 28 years in experience. Um, 10,000 employees, so again, a lot of different people um, that understand um, logistics and amongst those people, specialists within the healthcare environment. This was the study that we did with uh, OPPI. It was an investment that, um, that we undertook to help understand the market and to make recommendation to, uh, to Indian government. So to policy makers, we were prepared to uh, make that recommendation because we think if we invest in your market, then you're going to become much better and we can be your provider of choice. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave you um, just to think about DHL. We are a large organisation. We believe that we have um, areas of reliability um, and expertise within the healthcare industry. We certainly work with um, a lot of the manufacturers, um, both Indian and global. Um, I'd welcome you to, um, to start dialogue. Thank you. enthusiasm brings the synergy in any personality. To talk on nutraceuticals, we invite Francois Licopi, CEO, Ubeck Laboratory, Belgium. Please, sir. Satya, thanks a lot for inviting me a second time in a year to present uh, the European OTC market and my company in front uh, of such a, a big audience. Uh, let, me, let me start uh, to do a little bit of marketing because last time I had the, the occasion to go through this part. So, uh, we are a pharmaceutical company based in Brussels in Belgium. Uh, we have developed 20 different uh, food supplement formulation. Uh, mainly based on phytotherapy, so you find in there mainly dry extract of plants. Uh, but the major part of, I would say, uh, our investment research has been into devising an 
enzymatic complex which do increase the bioavailability of a certain number of nutrients you do find in tool formulation. And I believe I wouldn't have time to go uh, into details about this uh, enzymatic complex, uh, but it attracts a lot of uh, attention here in India as uh, in Europe and other regions. Um, we will not go through all those uh, uh, 20 <coughs> products. You just have to know that we are covering uh, by now eight different therapeutic areas uh, from liver to inflammation, from menopause to uh, diabetes. Uh, we are active in, in quite a lot of uh, fields that could uh, be uh, um, treated thanks to plants, thanks to herbals and botanicals. Uh, we also differentiate a little bit by our marketing. Our marketing is also of importance uh, even in the healthcare sector. So uh, you see on that uh, uh, screenshot uh, some of our boxes. All of them are the same. They are uh, light blue with a metallic sheen with a number, so it's easy for the customer to be recognized. They are a batch number one, a batch number two, till a batch number 20 with the claims just under our, uh, our name. Uh, so to, to make it in a, in a nutshell, I think that the company uh, does uh, differentiate by its scientific advantage, so this enzymatic complex, <coughs> by a therapeutic advantage, because we have a lot of different molecules, active uh, principles into all of our formulations, till, till eight of them, compared with the competition, we normally have two, three or four of them, with marketing differentiation points and what of importance, and we have come to that, it's about regulatory, we do comply with all the new regulation about uh, uh, following the EFSC. EFSC is the European Food and Safety Authority in Europe. We've already been talking about regulation. Regulation is a very important point and we are focusing on that uh, also. So to come back to, I would say, a more general topic, uh, the, su uh, the subject I have to address uh, this evening, uh, let me try to define a little bit what is OTC market because it's quite complex. Uh, OTC does mean over-the-counter, uh, but you can find medicine which are over-the-counter. So some medicines are not under prescription. But normally, uh, besides of the medicine uh, which do not need a uh, prescription, what do you find under the labeling OTC? It's the nutraceuticals, what, where our company is active in, but also uh, uh, what we call vitamins and dietary supplements what we called uh, also traditional herbal medicines. There could be some confusion between food supplement and traditional herbal medicines. We will not have the time to make a dis distinction between all of those sub-segments, but you have to know that uh, they are not a big player in that market. It's not like in the pharma market, where you have giants like Pfizer, GSK, and, uh, and the Sanofis with a, a big market share. In the OTC market, they are very fragmented. Here on a worldwide basis, following the latest uh, statistic, uh, if I'm quite well, is Johnson & Johnson, which is the market leader on a worldwide basis, with 5.2%, which, uh, which is quite low. You go to India, you go to Belgium, you go to a different part of the world, everybody has a small share of this market, but this market is growing, as we will show, and also this ma market is concentrating. There are a lot of merger and acquisition in, in that market. Uh, so, uh, to, to give you a big picture, some, some facts and figures, uh, this market, the whole OTC market is uh, $110 billion a year. Uh, it, Europe's account for 38 of that, the US uh, about the, the 36, 35, and the rest of the world, the world for uh, the rest, so it's one third for Europe, one third for the US, and I would say one third for Asia. Uh, there are different definitions of, of, of uh, the OTC markets. Uh, I've taken the one of uh, Nicholas Hall, Nicholas Hall, which is uh, one of the major uh, consulting uh, uh, agency active in, in that field. And they say that uh, the OTC uh, business uh, do contain traditional medicine, coven coal preparation, vitamins and minerals, and so on and so on. Uh, so the definition can differ from one uh, consultant to another, but I think that by now you have a more clear view of what is an OTC? OTC could be, would say, uh, differentiated from the medicine, from, from the drugs, even if 
some of those medicines could be considered as uh, OTC uh, business. What is of importance regarding the OTC business uh, compared to the pharma business is that the OTC business for the last four years has grown by much more than the pharma business. You know that uh, the pharma uh, does come with a lot of problems, finding new molecules. There are a lot of uh, uh, patents that does expire last year, coming years. And so uh, since the uh, past four years, the OTC business has increased by much more than the pharma business. And so the share of the OTC market in all the healthcare markets is growing from 10% uh, to 12%. To and this share will uh, continue, I think, to, to increase. To come back to the European market, because it's the, would say, uh, topic uh, that was uh, uh, my topic of today, uh, you have also a lot of discrepancies between, I would say, uh, the type, uh, the definition we can find over there, but also between the growth rates uh, we have uh, in Europe. As you may know, there are very major markets like France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, and they have, I would say, the newcomers, all the uh, Eastern European countries, which uh, shows quite a heavy uh, growth rate, more than 15% of growth rate. So growth rate which are quite comparable with the one we uh, can find here in uh, India. The biggest market uh, is uh, Germany, but uh, Italy is also a very good performer for size uh, in Europe. Uh, Italy uh, does uh, like uh, nutraceuticals. Uh, so maybe there's not yet some member of the government, uh, people from uh, different ministries by uh, the audience who right now, but what is also of interest to know is that OTC business is also good for the health budget spenders. That's a study which was made by a uh, uh, US agency, but you could tell the same in Europe, you could tell the same in, with uh, not the same level, but the uh, same story could be also told in India and other countries. OTC business allows to, would say, decrease the share of uh, spending for, would say, patients. Because they, it's allowed to avoid to go to the doctors, it avoids to take maybe uh, more expensive uh, medicines by taking OTC in a number of cases, I wouldn't say for serious disease, but uh, in a lot <coughs> of chronic disease, it could help uh, the patient, of course, it would avoid him to visit the doctors and so would allow also the budget spending on healthcare to be, to be lowered. Um, just to come back uh, once again about the definition not of the OTC sector but of the nutraceutical business. So the nutraceutical business is a part of this OTC business. Normally we define the nutraceutical business in three different parts. That's at, at least the way we are doing in Europe. There's the vitamin and mineral business. But uh, with a high dosage, for example, in India, this business is not considered as nutraceuticals, as food supplements, but as drugs. Uh, so there are a lot of discrepancies between Europe, uh, Asia, uh, and even the, the US, even in the definition of, I would say, uh, some of those segments and sub-segments. We also normally uh, find in uh, that uh, sub-sector plants, uh, herbal preparation, botanicals, and other substances with nutritional and physiological effects. So what's of importance to, to tell you also is that there are more and more research being uh, performed uh, in the field of the nutrition. So we find more and more publication in scientific journals, uh, in the JAMA, in uh, Elsevier Medical Journal, and so on. You used to see one or two uh, studies about botanicals 10 or 20 years from now. Now you have dozen and even more uh, published uh, on a monthly on a monthly basis. You have to you have to know that uh, still by now, 60% of the drugs do copy the molecule that you find by modern nature, that you find in the plant and in the in herbal preparation. And certainly, you know that uh, the first blockbuster of uh, the uh, pharma industry, the aspirin and penicillin, do come from I would say modern modern nature. Also, do come from some uh, pets. Uh, so this business is attracting a lot of attention, not only from uh, food supplement players, from nutritional players, but also from pharma players, because those pharma players, as I told you, have more and more difficulties to discover new molecules, to develop new things, and so it's easier for them to bring to the market uh, some uh, nutritionals. Um, as I have to focus on, on Europe, I will go through a bit very quickly on, on uh, the 
the main part of the regulation uh, regarding uh, this uh, business in Europe. Uh, it's quite complex, it's quite evolving, it's also evolving in India because uh, I've heard that by the end of this month uh, there would be a draft proposed by the uh, Ministry regarding uh, asking for public opinion regarding uh, the new uh, regulation uh, on the uh, food supplements. We've been told that very recently in Europe because maybe I've already talked about the EFSA, European Food Safety Authority, they have no uh, ask for some uh, claims to be recognized as positive or negative, so there have been more than 2,500 uh, claims which have been considered as being negative and only 222 as having been considered as positive. So, no, by no, food supplement uh, manufacturers in Europe could only use those 222 uh, positive health claims and all the rest is suppressed. I think that's something good because it, it gives some more credential to the food supplement market and uh, uh, I, I think that it's a positive point and even if regulatory could be a hurdle, it also could be uh, some kind of opportunity. Um, I will not go into the details between, I would say, the what is harmonized and not harmonized in, in Europe, uh, but you have to say, you have to know that uh, plant business and the, the herbals, the botanicals are not harmonized on a European level, it means that some Herbal, some botanicals could be considered as food supplements in Belgium, Italy, France, for example, and the same could be considered as drugs. So it increased the level of difficulties, and so you could not market the same products uh, all over all over you. Um, I already told, uh, addressed uh, this point so about the negative uh, claims and the positive uh, claims. Uh, happily, uh, all the botanicals are considered by now uh, as being either not, not uh, positive and not negative, they are on a on old list and by being on a old old on, on, on old list they are still authorized and so as we do use uh, a lot of those botanicals we are quite happy and quite lucky because the claims we use uh, to, uh, uh, to, to have are still available and we can still use the same claims as uh, before this uh, legislation. Uh, to focus on the nutritional business, the food supplement business, I told you that the uh, OTC business one was $110 billion. The uh, nutritional business on a worldwide basis is uh, $45 billion. Same would say uh, uh, segmentation, 30% for the US, 30% for Europe, and 30% uh, for the rest of the world. Biggest markets, Italy, Germany, uh, in, uh, in Europe. The growth rate, uh, I already told uh, tell about this bigger, of course, in the Eastern European countries. And uh, you could notice that uh, inside the European countries themselves, uh, the botanicals that are the most uh, well marked are very different from one country to another. Uh, it's depending about the legislation, it's depending <coughs> about the habits of the uh, different uh, population. Uh, German and the French do not use necessarily the same type, say, of uh, formulation. Uh, and so it uh, also makes uh, a market which is very fragmented, which is not uh, well harmonized and it's, which is much difficult to be uh, entered. Uh, also concerning the distribution channel, that's of importance that those distribution channels also are variating from one country to another. For example, if you could only enter the markets in Belgium by going through the doctors, in France, for example, it's mainly done through the pharmacist and the power pharmacist, even through the supermarket, supermarkets. In the US it could be totally different, you could already penetrate the market through the internet. In other countries it's a mass media, uh, it's TV campaigns, so the distribution channels for those uh, different type of products could differ by a big way, uh, even given the country we are talking about. Uh, the biggest, uh, I would say, sub-segment in uh, this uh, nutritional market are also uh, different from one country to another. I took here the example of France. Uh, in France, the biggest sub-market is weight management, uh, but this market is decreasing because uh, there were quite a lot of problems with uh, some weight management formulation, and the therapeutic kind of formulation are, uh, on the contrary, on the increase. So, a preparation which uh, do treat cholesterol, which do treat uh, diabetes, which do treat a uh, problem with the your eyes and something like that do have a very big increase 
and the one uh, which, they, which were more common, like weight management, are on the decrease. So just to, to uh, finalize with a, a quick look on, on, on India and its uh, positioning, uh, this uh, chart uh, shows uh, the increase in the value, uh, that's the, the, blue, the blue bars, uh, of uh, different, uh, the biggest markets for the coming uh, five years. Uh, India is in the, the, we'll say the, the latest position of uh, this chart, but it's still number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, number, number ten, which is not so, so bad. And you have the, the weights, uh, bullets, which is showing, showing the growth rate, which is nearly 10%. Uh, so certainly, even if the food supplement nutritional business here in India by now is quite small, it's $200 million if you do not take into account the vitamins and the minerals. Um, it is a market which is uh, growing quite rapidly, and a lot of companies here, uh, even pharma companies, are having a look uh, into this uh, nutritional business by now. So I do not know if I have some time to take questions, but I think. Uh, but thank you, Satya, for having me. smart and beautiful but some people can be made smart beautiful handsome through facial aesthetics ladies and gentlemen pharma leaders invite leading personality in this field dr shubha dharmanna cosmetic dermatologist laser specialist hair transplant surgeon ceo dr shubha skin and laser clinic to speak on innovative trends in facial aesthetics Indian challenges with global experiments. Dr. Shubha, please. Thank you for that kind introduction. Hi, a very good evening to all of you. Quite a few inspiring talks we've had today. It feels quite intimidating but I'm quite thrilled to be present here, thanks to Mr. Satya Brahma. I have a very challenging topic and I have very little time to discuss all of this. So I'm afraid I'll have to rush through the slides. I'm quite acutely aware of the time. Um, let me take you to the concept of, concept of beauty first. What is beauty? A lot of people have tried to uh, define beauty there is two things that come up consistently. One is symmetry and the other one is proportion. Some people view beauty in terms of art, in terms of science. They've come up with mathematical equations, with some mathematical numbers, the magic number, the golden number, the golden proportion, the divine proportion. This lady we all know is Queen Nefertiti. She is considered worldwide as the woman with the perfect face. Why is her face so perfect? It's again, it's they have worked on the basis of proportions. If you look at her features, they're all in perfect proportion to the entire face. And then Leonardo da Vinci came up with this painting, the Vitruvian Man. He's tried to define the ideal male proportions. And he's done lots of work with the male body, with the faces, again working on proportions. We all know that when the symmetry of the face is disturbed, it's not pleasing to look at. There is obviously a little bit of asymmetry between two sides of the face, but any major asymmetry and it's not considered aesthetic. And then there is, they have come up with this mathematical uh, sequence of numbers, a very unique sequence of numbers called the Fibonacci sequence. This is nothing but um, the, it's, it's, it's a number equals to the sum of the two preceding numbers. Uh, now these numbers are present in nature, they're present in beauty, and uh, it just equates again 
uh, back to proportions, back to the golden number, which is 0 0.618. It means that when this proportion is present, it is quite pleasing for the eye to look at. This is present in sunflower heads, it's present in the spiral of um, uh, the seashells, snail shells, sorry. And then there is this very beautiful women that are considered extremely aesthetic. They've studied models and they've studied the actresses' faces that are considered universally beautiful. And what is it that makes them very aesthetic, very beautiful? Probably proportions, probably the divine number. Aging in skin has a lot to do with basically there is the intrinsic or the internal factors which are determined by your genes, your hormones and your biological clock. And then there is the external factors like the sunlight and then there is uh, the alcohol, the smoking, the environment, the pollution, lack of sleep, all these play a factor. When skin begins to age, that is it happens in the mid-twenties, we develop wrinkles. And not just wrinkles and fine lines, but then the skin is thin, it loses its elasticity, we lose collagen, and then we develop um, thread veins, fine veins, pigmentation, the skin is drier, looks dull. So there's a lot of changes that happen in our skin. You might have heard the concept of the uh, inverted tri the triangle. Uh, in youth, the triangle points downwards, but as you can see, when we grow older, the, this concept is reversed. The base of the triangle is at the bottom and the apex is pointing towards the forehead. So, um, with aging, you could develop wrinkles on the forehead, the frown lines, the crow's feet, below the eyes, and then there could be um, the uh, nose to mouth lines, you would lose the cheek pad, uh, the fat on the cheeks, um, you could develop marionette lines, jowls. So the fight that we fight is in cosmetic medicine is non-invasive versus the invasive. And we all know nowadays the western world and all of us are moving towards the non-invasive. And why do we move towards the non-invasive? Because this little downtime, it won't break your bank. There's less side effects and complications. These are often lunchtime procedures. They're less painful and certainly not as taboo as plastic surgery. And there's no need for anesthesia. All of us lead active social lives, so we don't want to be put, put out of um, work for a long time. So, um... I would talk about Botox injections again. I don't want to go too much into this as we don't have time, but there is a number of botulinum toxin injections nowadays. This, it was The market was dominated by one or two toxins. Now we have a lot more of them. We have Dysport, we have Xeomin, we have Azilor, Neuronox, etc. It finds its use in the wrinkles for it, uh, the, um, over the frown lines and uh, off-label is also used for a lot of other indications. It's used to turn up the drooping corners of the mouth, they use for smoker's lines, it's used to correct masters, so it can change the shape of the face. There is, um, the, the people have been talking quite a lot about the Botox boob lift. Now what is that? Botox can be given in your chest muscles, in the small muscles, in the pectoralis minor, and uh, what happens is the back muscles compensate and then it lifts up the breasts. This is a master correction. You can see how the angle of the, how the shape of the face can be transformed from a square to an oval shape. The Botox boob, boob lift. And then fillers. Dermal fillers are used to volumize the face. As we grow older, we lose collagen from the face. And these injections could be um, hyaluronic acid fillers, they could be collagen fillers, they could be permanent ones. The permanent ones, we do not prefer the permanent ones because of the risk of complications that uh, we could end up with. There is semi-permanent fillers that are coming into, into the market, like Sculptra, for example, or Radius. And uh, these um, can 
you, you can have long-lasting results with the semi-permanent fillers. The hyaluronic acid containing fillers are quite preferred uh, methods of rejuvenation these days and there is many that you might have heard of. There's Juvederm, there's Restylane, Valuderm, Estalis and so on and so forth. marionette lines and um, the, uh, they can be used to augment the lips, the chin and the cheeks. What's new with the fillers? We have plenty more fillers coming into our market. Uh, there is jumped. We're, we're talking about fillers that are combined with lignocaine or lidocaine that makes it less painful and uh, there is um, fillers that can be used in the hand, they can be used on the chest in the decrotage. There is fillers that they're using in the foot pad to minimize heel pain when you're wearing high heels and uh, they're there is also the highly volumizing fillers like macrolein which can be used to shape the body. They can be used for breast augmentation. There is also fat transfer that we are talking about nowadays. The good thing about fat transfer is it's, it's inexpensive and it's quite abundant in all of us. There is no allergic reactions to this and uh, the problem with fat transfer has been the inconsistency. It can last anywhere between 6 months and 10 years. But nowadays with the advances we have in preparing and harvesting the fat, the results could long much longer. And then the chemical peels. The chemical peels work by causing damage to the outer layers of the skin. They are nothing but acid peels. They are diluted and they are used on the skin. And then the skin tries to repair itself by regenerating. This causes more evenly distributed melanin and lesser melanin to be produced. So this helps in pigmentation problems. It could help with fine lines, acne, acne scars and sun damage. It also improves the tone and texture of the skin and can impart it a healthy glow. Peels are again divided based on the way they work. They could be superficial peels, they could be medium depth peels and they could be really deep peels. We don't do deep peels here on Asian skin because of the risk of complications that we have. We do tend to form pigmentation or, you know, severe scarring. What's new with the peels? There's a lot of peels that come into the market uh, and there is combination peels that we're using now. The good thing with the combination peels is that there is less side effects and there's more uh, they're more consistent at achieving what they aim to achieve. And then there's of course the advanced super peels that everybody talks about. What are these super peels? They are peels as well but there is no visible peeling. So they're like mild peels and there's more moisturizing agents incorporated into the treatment. Now peels can be used along with microderm abrasion or skin polishing and they can be used in combination with other peels and lasers. See some of the before and after pictures of uh, peels and then the skin exfoliating treatments like microderm abrasion for example, they work in a similar manner but by mechanically abrading the superficial layers of the skin. So they could be, they could do it with salt, they would use um, aluminium salt or sodium chloride. It's like a sandpapering effect and then some people use diamond tip. On the, on, on the machine to cause the abrasion. There is also hydrofacial which has picked up quite a lot in India and is a very famous and popular treatment in the West. This again is nothing but a liquid microderm abrasion. So whilst exfoliating and abrading the top layers of the skin, it also infuses 
and uh, it infuses serum into the skin. It also extracts impurities, blackheads, whiteheads, and then it also hydrates the skin. Um, there's there is combination treatment that you can do with these exfoliating treatments. You could combine them with enzyme paste. You could combine them with lasers, with peels, with electroporation. And then there is derma roller treatment. This has received a lot of news. It's not been a single big magazine which hasn't covered this in the last two to three years. And it still remains one of the more popular treatments here. Derma roller treatment is nothing but basically just a skin needling treatment. It is a roller which has sterile needles all over with which we roll on the skin, obviously after using a numbing agent. And this causes microscopic wounds in the skin that leads to more collagen production and it helps improve acne scars or stretch marks. Lasers have a lot of role in uh, aesthetic medicine. There is uh, the laser hair removal. Uh, we all know that laser hair removal is a permanent reduction of hair. The laser light is absorbed by the melanin that is present in the hair follicles and it is destroyed. And typically you would need about six to eight sittings. The regrowth is much finer and it is lighter. There's a lot of different technologies that use this laser hair removal. There is NDAG, Ruby lasers, Alexandrite, IPL diode, and then there's combination lasers. Um, Laser hair removal can be done on most areas of the body, even the most sensitive and the most private areas can be treated if you select the appropriate fluence and uh, a machine that is suitable to do dark areas. The latest technology, the technology that is used in lasers combines two different modalities. Like for example, the ELOS technology combines um, the radio frequency along with diode. So uh, that just means that the patient, it, can, it could be done on darker skins and has very little or no side effects. And then we've seen the Bollywood Khans and Hrithik Roshan who have spawned an entire generation of young men who want laser hair removal. They want permanent reduction, they want bare chest. They ask for laser hair removal on the chest, on the back, on the arms. The beard shaping is quite a preferred treatment these days. I don't remember the last time I've seen this on screen. Then there is the fractional resurfacing. This works more or less like the derma roller, but it is done with the help of a laser. The laser beam is fractionated into uh, is, is 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 basically fractionated into tiny pixels, and this causes microscopic wounds on the skin that again produces collagen and uh, causes an improvement in scars. Um, there is. Different energies are fractionated. Apart from laser energy, they, they also use infrared and then they use the radio frequency as well, which has uh, very little side effects. Those are some of the results of uh, uh, fractional resurfacing. That is after one treatment and this is after three sittings. In pigmentation, lasers are used again. There are different types of lasers. IPL is really good for um, vascular for vascularities, people who have red veins, or and it improves the pigmentation. There is infrared lasers uh, like the Q-switch and DAG, erbium glass, etc. They help in the improvement of the lines. And radio frequency energy is mainly it could be unipolar or bipolar. It helps in firming and tightening the skin. Tattoo removal can be done with a Q-switched NDAG, Q-switched Ruby or a Q-switched Alexandrite. And there is vascular lasers like a pulse dye laser which can be used to remove birth marks and vascular lesions. So, um, most tattoos can be removed. It would take about 6 to 10 sittings to remove a tattoo. Uh, but obviously there are some tattoos that cannot be helped like this one. <coughs> And then there is a new laser in, um, called the MedLite. This is, again, it's, more, it's, it's a Q-switch NDAG laser, but with more sophisticated engineering. It uses photoacoustic energy. It can be used in combination with peels or with other skin lightening agents. And this provides a very good um, treatment. It's a very good treatment option for people with tough or stubborn melasma and pigmentation. There is this non-surgical lipo that everybody is talking about. 
Now, although I think it's a misnomer, although it's called a non-surgical lipo, I really, um, it's not for uh, weight reduction or fat reduction. It is done in a relatively slim person who has pockets of fat, pockets of localized fat that do not respond to diet or exercise. Yes, and then radio frequency works by heating the dermal layers of the skin and it causes a tissue tightening. So it can reduce the circumference of the area. Ultrasonic waves are used. These are deep focused ultrasonic waves which can destroy the fat cells and but you need multiple <coughs> sittings to achieve the result. There is this cool sculpting that um, that, uh, that has spread into India. This is again FTA clear and it is a patented procedure. Um, it works by cooling and freezing the fat cells. Some lasers use a combination technology and then some lasers work by massaging the fat. That is called the lipo massage. This, this patient of mine has lost four inches with ultrasound technology. And then what's new in hair transplantation? We do FUE, which is follicular unit extraction. What is this? This is not a strip method. Here the follicles are taken out, they're extracted individually by in the back of the head and they're planted in front. So there's no linear scars, there's no cuts, there's no stitches. It's less painful, quicker recovery. It's used in young people and also it renders itself to body hair transplantation. And the other trends right now in hair transplantation is robotic hair transplantation. And then there is the sapphire sphere tip blades for implantation. They minimize trauma. They're sharper. There's power FUE machines and neograph machines which have come and flooded the Indian market. We have good magnifying microscopes, advanced video imaging techniques. Um, and then there is better handling of the graphs and knowledge about post-op care. All of these improve the results. This is a client of mine after a few weeks. And finally, just about about cosmeceuticals. Um, cosmeceuticals is a very large market for the pharmaceutical industry. They all come up with cosmetic products which actually which claim to have biological active ingredients and which claim to produce